Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Fletcher. I'm the Programs and Engagement Coordinator here at the Haley Public Library. Tonight's talk, Reflections on Annie Pike Greenwood with Idaho Public TV producer and documentarian Marsha Franklin, explores Greenwood and We Sagebrush Folks, her 1934 book that vividly documented a hard scrabble life in South Central Idaho from a woman's perspective. We always like to feature um, one of the books in our collections, and this is the one I want to feature tonight. Uh, Annie Pike Greenwood's We Sagebrush Folks. This is a reprint, um, inexpensive reprint out of uh, Canada. And we have that on our bookshelf now as part of our uh, book club selections. So it's uh, available there now. So without further ado, I am uh, honored and delighted to introduce to you Marsha Franklin. Marsha Franklin has been a journalist at Idaho Public Television since 1990. She's the producer and host of Dialogue, a statewide conversation program focusing on the humanities, which began in 1994. During the pandemic, she also started a series called The 180, featuring individuals who have made turnarounds in their lives. Franklin is also a producer for Idaho Experience, a history series, and Outdoor Idaho, a series that covers environmental and outdoor issues in Idaho. She is the past managing editor and host of Idaho Reports, the station's legislative program, and her programs have honored have garnered numerous awards, including a George Foster Peabody Award, the Silver Gavel Award of the American Bar Association, and five regional Emmys. And if you had a chance to watch um, the Idaho Experience look at uh, Greenwood, you can see why she wins all those awards. So Marsha is a native of Washington, DC, and has an undergraduate degree from Harvard College and a master's degree in journalism for North, from Northwestern University. She enjoys reading, cycling, travels, and felines. So um, without further ado, Marsha, I'm going to spotlight you and um, we will get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Kristen. I am a huge fan of libraries. And in fact, I wrote most of my documentary on Annie Pike Greenwood in two local branches of the Boise Public Library. <laughs> I have no doubt that Annie herself would share my sentiment. Indeed, in one of her unpublished essays, she wrote, it is the public library that has provided me with the great joy of intimacy with the choicest minds of all time. That being said, she would also want you to buy her book. <laughs> More on that later with some fun news to share, and you'll be some of the first to hear that news, so stay tuned, as we say in my business. This is also special for me because Annie's birthday is coming up. She was born on November 16th, 1879. I really get a kick out of that kind of synchronicity, which actually happened throughout this project. And I'm enthused that some of you are in a book club that's going to be discussing We Sagebrush Folks next week. For others watching, if you haven't read the book, I encourage you to do so. I think you'll be drawn in immediately. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. And here we go. So how did I become uh, be, come to be slightly obsessed with this woman born nearly 150 years ago who lived in Idaho for less than 15 years. Well, someone in my book club back in the 1990s lent me We Sagebrush Folks saying she had really enjoyed it. It was the paperback edition which had been published in 1988 to dovetail with the upcoming Idaho Centennial in 1990. I opened the book and started reading, and I was astonished. In it, Greenwood described how desperately ill she had become after the birth of her daughter Rhoda in 1914, an illness she surmised was caused by a catheter inserted into her by the, quote, sheep doctor who had delivered her baby. When she lost consciousness, her husband rushed her by car to a train, which then took her to a hospital in Twin Falls. 
He did so, she wrote, despite the fact that the sheep doctor had told him it was, quote, foolish. If she's going to get well, she'll get well right here, Annie says the man told her husband. And if she's going to die, you'll have all that useless expense. By that time, wrote Annie, I was insane. I was living in a land of unreality with whose difficulties I had no power to cope. Then the hospital doctor, wrote Greenwood, experimented on me. When nothing seemed to work, he told her husband that she would likely die, but that he could try one more thing. I'll turn down the covers and spank her, and she'll come too, he said. Well, Annie recovered, and apparently the doctor's innovative method wasn't ever used, because in her typical sardonic fashion, she wrote that if he had hit her, quote, I should have bitten him until his glacial blood ran in streams. Needless to say, reading that piqued my interest for more. I thumbed through the book, perusing the chapters, each of which had a spare heading that could have actually competed with the chapters of a medical textbook. Wilderness, politics, education, birth, sex. Yes, there is a chapter in We Sagebrush Folks just called Sex. I am including it, Greenwood wrote, because I believe that without it, a true picture cannot be given of a sagebrush folks. Yet it is hard for me to tell what I shall tell because some of the grossest things I must relate were perpetrated by people I liked. Right there, we see the Annie Pike Greenwood who was a journalist. We see the Annie Pike Greenwood who despised hypocrisy. We see the Annie Pike Greenwood who cared about those who had less. We see the Annie Pike Greenwood who was a bit foolhardy. And we see the Annie Pike Greenwood who was, in my opinion, brave. Here was a woman in 1934 writing about issues that certainly weren't openly discussed then, including the abuse of women and girls, mental illness, child labor, murder, and suicide. She was speaking up and she was speaking out for those who couldn't. This was Me Too before there was a two. Writing about controversial subjects like that and during a depression, no less, wasn't gonna make her friends or help her sales, but she couldn't not write about them. I felt from birth that I must state the truth of human life as I see it, she wrote. Of Greenwood's writing, former Idaho State professor Susan Swetnam says, not only is this something that is supposed to not have happened on the frontier where everybody got along and cooperated, it's also something that in that time and place was not something that one wrote about. But Annie also painted scenes of immense beauty. Here's some lines that could have been written today. The sweet November rain in Idaho, fragrant, musical, soaking the ground in preparation for winter, running in streams from eaves, intoxicating delight of calm, delicately gray November days. Here's another word painting of hers that I imagine those of us in Idaho can relate to. That first summer began my love for Idaho above all other states I have known. Perhaps it was because I sat up in the clouds. There is something about mere altitude that clarifies the vision. It was a lovely valley, the blue Minidoka Mountains to the south, the white Sawtooth Mountains to the north, the black sprawling buttes to the west. And there was in my mind the constant sense of a limitless sky over the surface of which the changing clouds floated. There were also striking passages about survival in what we can certainly term as below sand Idaho. Anyone who's lived in Jerome County where she did knows how continuous the wind is. And in those days, there was very little relief from trees or structures. It was not all beautiful, she wrote. Idaho's wild winds rage for days at a time, lifting the earth in great clouds of dust. Fields were literally transferred by the power of these winds, some of the land having to be sown over again. On everything within the house lay a thick gray powder, like that on a moth's wings exaggerated 10,000 times. Hair was transformed to dun color, eyebrows 
shelved with it, skin thickly coated, eyes red and smarting, teeth gritty. The soul of the desert, I used to think that wind, making its last protest against being tamed. One might say that about the writer herself. Annie did not want to be tamed. Even reading just a few pages like those, I thought the book would make a riveting one woman play, and I still do. I thought Annie's story had promise as a documentary, but there was no venue at my television station to do that. Idaho Public Television had already aired its capstone series on Idaho history called Proceeding On Through a Beautiful Country, and there were no plans to continue it. Fast forward more than 20 years to 2017, when Idaho Public Television decided to launch Idaho Experience, a series that was once again rooted in Idaho history. With my interest in both literature and the lives of unheralded women, I knew immediately what my first topic would be, Annie Pike Greenwood. I quickly learned though that enthusiasm alone wouldn't fuel this particular desire. It would be much harder than I thought. Television is a visual medium as we all know, and I knew there would be no film footage of Annie, but there seemed to be no photos either. I scoured the Idaho Historical Society and local historical societies. No go. It was if, as it, it was if she had never lived there. So I'm going to share my screen and show you there is one physical homage to Annie Pike Greenwood, a crumbling school on the north side of I-84 near, near Hazelton, Idaho, still referred to as the Greenwood School. It was named after her. In fact, that whole area is still called Greenwood on online maps, which I found very interesting. And her home was still stand standing when I was doing research. But no one who had known her was still alive. No families had photos of her. And the woman who had done the most research on Greenwood, Professor Joanne Rockman of Idaho State University had unfortunately passed away. I wish I had been able to meet her. I knew though that Professor Ruckman had spoken with Annie's daughter Rhoda in her final years because she mentioned it in the foreword to the 1988 edition, which she wrote. So I tried to track down Rhoda's children, if there were any. Through a combination of old fashioned research and luck, ultimately one of my big leads came through a groundskeeper at a cemetery in Utah. I located her one son, Kingsley which wasn't easy because he's one of those people who wisely keeps his presence off the internet. And lo and behold, he had the proverbial boxes in the basement, boxes that I had been told by a source had definitely been thrown away, but they hadn't been. They had been left to him by his mother, Rhoda, and they hadn't been open in decades. Some had even been outside in a shed and everything in them was about Annie. So let's take a look here. Here's where synchronicity comes in. Just a few months before I contacted him, Kingsley had decided that he finally needed to do something with the material and he had delivered this trunk full to Idaho State University. He had decided that that was the best place for the material because Professor Ruckman had done so much to help republish We Sagebrush Folks in 1988. So when I reached him, he was pretty stunned at the coincidence and I think because of that, he wanted to pursue the story further with me. He mentioned that he had found even more material. Did I want to see it? Well, for a producer, unopened boxes are like a legal drug. So director Bill Crum and I headed as soon as possible to Ogden where Kingsley lives to film them, him, to film him opening them up. And you can see here in the hallway, there's a picture of Annie Pike Greenwood in one of the boxes. You can see him going uh, through it. So what were in those boxes? It turned out exactly what I had been hoping for. There were some of her first pieces of writing as a child, including a newspaper she made here, the Sunday Star for Children, and a submission to a children's magazine called Youth Companion, 
youth's companion. She even saved the rejection letter she got from them. And uh, I, I had to put this in, I love this. On the right-hand side of her newspaper, you can see that it says, everyone who writes for this paper must be a subscriber. Monthly subscription is 10 cents. The paper comes out once a week. So she was on it, man. Um, and I just, it was amazing seeing this material. Both of these, uh, these uh, early writings really illustrate the way she describes herself and we sagebrush folks, she says, inside me, I had always been a writer. I remember as one remembers first love, that moment when I knew I had been born to write. Also in the boxes uh, were, this was amazing filming this, we filmed Kingsley pulling this out, original manuscript of we sagebrush folks. And then when he did that, he turned to the camera and he goes, I think we have something here. Um, and it, uh, it included changes on them, you know, like her edits. And um, there were also letters in there from her editor to her. And, you know, both those things, we don't always think about it because uh, it's a little academic, but it's really important. The letters from the editor and her editorial marks really help us understand that the process of writing, you know, what changes were made and, and why. In there, there were also unpublished manuscripts, which is pretty poignant, showing how she kept writing even after We Sagebrush Folks was published and what subjects interested her. Two miracles in particular, or it was called These Are Your Children. As she mentions here, this is the true story of a group of juvenile delinquents in a real reform school. They are your children only because they are the children nobody else wants. Do not reject them lightly. I think this one, and I, Joanne mentions it in her introduction, um, I, I would really like to read this and to see something happen with it because it seems to have some import to it. Um, there are also journals, which you know is really essential to understanding um, somebody's thoughts and what was going on in their mind. And, um, you know, she saved all these things. She could have burnt them and throw them away, but she saved them. And critical for me as a documentarian, there were photos. Not a lot. We producers always want more photos, but there were photos and they were like gold to me. So here I am in Ogden scanning everything, which took at least a whole day. I also went through every piece of material that Kingsley had just donated to Idaho State University. And so, you know, with, with the knowledge, with the material and uh, Kingsley's cooperation, I knew now that I could move forward and make a documentary. So what do we know about Annie Pike Greenwood, Anna Pike? She was born, as mentioned, in 1879 in Provo, Utah. Her father, Walter Pike, was a doctor and had founded the state asylum. Although he was not LDS, his sister had converted to the faith when they were growing up in England. The sister had emigrated to America and Walter uh, stowed away on a boat with a group of Mormons and eventually made his way to Utah where she lived. Um, Annie grew up in this house, uh, so she would have been quite privileged for the time and probably even today. Um, and although she wasn't LDS, she went to what is now BYU and uh, graduated in the class of 1900, as we see here, the college century class. She is in the middle. I don't know if you can see my, can you see my little thing there? Okay, so that's Annie. And later as a true reporter does and she wrote everybody's name down and you know who they were married to and what had happened to them, which I thought was also really cool. And then on the right, you see the song for the, the school song for Brigham Young University, which she wrote the lyrics to. And it was a song that was used for, for many decades is my understanding. Um, but it's interesting. It appears that while they had money, uh, her father did not help her or her sister when they went out out on their own after college. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some sadness there. Despite that though, she became a teacher in rural Utah and then a reporter fulfilling her love for writing and her inquisitive nature. 
And I was able, it's amazing what you can find now um, through Chronicling America and newspapers.com. I was able to find these uh, articles that she wrote, which are great. And she even had her own column, Annie Pike's Syncopations. That's great. Um, and actually she was, she was um, skilled enough that she got a reporting job in Los Angeles. But shortly after uh, arriving, and I mean really shortly after arriving, she ran into this man, Charles Greenwood, on the street. She had met him in Salt Lake um, prior to that, and apparently there were sparks even then, and there were sparks this time, and just three days later, they were married in September 1905. She was around 25 years old. True to Annie's nature, there were even some articles in the paper about her whirlwind romance. And I half wonder if she wrote them because they were so cheeky. In one, her new husband is ribbed for not having enough time to properly get married. You can see here he gets his license, but he's too busy to marry. Um, <laughs> I, could, I could read on and on. They're, they're really quite funny. And Miss Annie Pike surprises friends you know, um, his suit was short, he was accepted, and before Miss Pike could fully realize all that happened, she was Mrs. Greenwood. This one here is called Cupid Got Her. Annie Pike, a well-known Utah writer, is married in Los Angeles, you know, and it, and it goes on, it's this long article about, you know, them meeting and, and getting married uh, really, really quickly. But, you know, it's really important that these exist because, you know, not only the, the, there's some amazing writing and humor in here, but, but actually it shows how quickly this union uh, came to be, which, you know, later would prove to be um, difficult. And it also shows her underlying concern about leaving what she really loved to do. Uh, in the midst of this article, there is a quote, what I can't get used to is the feeling of having nothing to do. She writes here, for the last six years, I have worked almost constantly and I keep grasping out for something to do. It seems as if I can't get rid of the idea that it is time for me to just get up to the office with that story. So it kind of presages, you know, what, what was to be. Now, her husband was interested in agriculture. Um, he, so they moved to Kansas. I can't remember if they have had family there or not. I think they may have, he may have. And he worked for some sort of credit services firm. But, you know, Annie gave up this promising career. Uh, but she did not stop writing. She kept writing. And in We Stagebrush Folks, she says, my middle name is Scribbling. And indeed, in the boxes, uh, there were scribbled journals from Kansas that were written on what appear to be some sort of log books for agricultural implements. Here we see hinges, hammers, hatchets that are crossed out. This slide here, between drill holders and drill breast, we can see how much she's struggling and just how important writing is to keeping her going. Right here, she says, I could die for love, but I could suffer in hell for ambition. It would have been just the way, other way around if love had been kind. In fact, I have died for love and am also suffering in hell for it. But ambition, is an angel that makes hell less unendurable. So she had ambitions and she wanted her career back, but it was for all intents and purposes too late. And it was about to get more difficult. As with many uh, men around the turn of the 20th century, white men, her husband was lured to Idaho by the promise of newly irrigated desert land. And he determined to start a little farm in Idaho this, this is the Milner Dam. The Milner Dam near Twin Falls was the main reason that anyone could even attempt to do this. The dam, which opened in 1905, was an engineering feat. And I've, I've been there. It's really interesting to go even today. It brought water all the way up from the Snake River. And, and then after that, these extensive canals that were dynamited open um, took all that water into land that had previously been considered just pass-through territory for pioneers because it was so dry. 
And as a result, land speculators were all the rage. As one professor told me, it was like our version of the dot-com boom. You can see here the Cary Act on the left-hand side, farmland opportunity unsurpassed and gooding. And then on the right side, I thought this was fun to show you. Here's one from the Big Wood River Irrigation Project. So right up in your neck of the wood, home seekers, not quite spelled correctly, home sick. <laughs> But the message got out, you know, and the in this when these type of ads were all over the country. Well, Annie, whose background was decidedly not in farming, was nonplussed about the move. The last thing in the world I wanted to do was go on a farm, she wrote. It was an utter absurdity even to think of such a thing. When I married, all I knew of housework was what I'd learned from looking in the dumb waiter that brought all our food to our dining room. But she already had two children. Here's her first. Here she is with her first. And you see how, just as a parenthetically, you see how just finding this photo, you know, really makes a difference. Um, and in those days, you know, if you have children, it, and where your husband goes is where you go. And it was really difficult to source when the Greenwoods left Kansas and arrived in Idaho. But from triangulating her diaries, census data, and events in her books, my informed guess is 1913, and I think that's what other people feel too. That differs, though, by the way, from what I had originally read, which had placed them there earlier, and that had been somewhat confusing to me. It appears that almost immediately Annie was asked to teach. She likely had the most education of any woman in the area. We know she taught for at least part of a year because that's mentioned in her book. And it was a tough year. In We Sagebrush Folks, she writes about seeing the room for the first time in which she was supposed to teach. And this is a representation in the book of her first school, she calls it. She writes, the key was turned, the sullen, unpainted plank door swung open, and there met my eyes the most terrifically disordered dump. That's what the sagebrush farmers call any house with which they are disgusted, she wrote. It had basically been used to throw everything in there that nobody wanted. All the grades were in one classroom and the children were cold and hungry. My heart was lacerated by the sight of the sore hands of the children who had been spud picking for a week, she wrote. According to another article she wrote at the time, she would feed the, feed the children soup to keep them nourished. And Annie's teaching methods were ahead of her time. She was very interested in the idea of experiential education, including the power of music and drama and the idea of field trips. She derided teachers actually who were trained at Idaho's Albion Normal School because she felt that all they did was give children the same rote education. Indeed, some of Annie's first national articles were about her educational methods, which included raising money to get the classroom of Victrola phonograph player. You can see the article on the left-hand side, the Victor in the rural school. And then on the right-hand side is an article about a Halloween party that was put on. And she used these things, you know, to, to teach as well. Um, a new school, school was already being built though. And Greenwood must have made quite an impression just in the short time that she had already been there because the superintendent, uh, who was a woman, told Annie that the school would be named for her. All this wonderful country is named after me, Annie wrote. The honor cannot last long. The name will be changed, blotted out, and I long forgotten. But now, there it is. Despite the school being named after her though, there's no evidence that Greenwood actually taught there. And this is another thing that I really wanted to source because it was being, there were books and articles that had this incorrectly uh, written about. Um, she and her husband did start the local Grange Hall there. They were involved with the Sunday school there and many a political discussion was held in that building. So it is more than appropriate. It was named after her, even if she didn't teach there. And the school has not been forgotten as she feared. It was closed in the 1950s. This is a picture of it from the 50s, I believe. Uh, but 
people in the area still hold a great fondness, fondness for it. In fact, one of our most popular Facebook posts was when we asked people to share their memories of the Greenwood School. They remember attending it or the Sunday school. They remember voting there, picnics on the grounds, you name it. And aside, when it was closed, the building was split in half and half of it is actually in Rupert, occupied by a Christian motorcycle club. So you can't make this stuff up. Really, really interesting. And went, I went to see it with, um, with Kingsley, with Annie's grandson. Um, if you've passed by though, you've seen that the building is in complete disrepair. Um, this was taken in 2017 or 2018. So it's even more woeful now. Um, in my documentary, I take you inside, um, courtesy of the current owner, Donald Morrow, who's a really lovely man. And Mr. Morrow, um, who's here with his grandson, I just love this picture. Um, he, he went to the school, he went to the Greenwood School, and he had a dream to fix it back up. And that's why he purchased it. But unfortunately, he hasn't been able to afford to do that. And with us out there, Hi, Joan. We can't see, maybe, I don't know if we can see you. Hi, Joan is waving. Is another graduate of the Greenwood School and a Haley resident, Joan Davies. And she's in this photo along with Donald Morrill when they were both at the Greenwood School. Joan, is this you? Do I have that right? Okay, well, she's, yeah. Well, she's muted. I think she's here. And as I recall, this might even be her mom. I think this might be Donald. Uh, anyway, fun photo courtesy of Joan Davies and um, really appreciate her being here today. She has another connection to Annie Pike Greenwood. Her family actually owns the old Greenwood farm and she's in my documentary talking about that. It's just really great to have you here with us, Joan. And for folks who haven't seen that documentary, it is online uh, for free. Just go to Idaho Experience and type in uh, Annie Pike Greenwood. You know, um, for some reason, Annie didn't teach in that school, and I just really don't know why. I'd love to ask her. But for one thing, she was really busy being a mother. Um, here are her four children in about 1919. Um, Joseph, Charles, Walter, and then Rhoda at the top, the, the, the sole female who was the mother of Kingsley. But despite being a, a mother and uh, keeping up with all sorts of civic activities, she kept uh, hoovering up details of stories around her for articles that she sent back to well-known magazines. And it was one of those articles, um, Letters from a Sagebrush Farm, published in Atlantic, Magazine, Atlantic Monthly in 1919, that became the seed for her eventual memoir, We Sagebrush Folks. Um, she really needed the money uh, from those articles desperately for her children and for herself. She said she used some of it just to get her teeth fixed. Now, this is a very rare, this is, this is the only known photo of Annie Pike Greenwood on the farm, as it were. Uh, it's really hard to see her and the kids. Um, pretty dire conditions, right? From where she grew up to, to here. Uh, meanwhile, in 1918, her husband had been elected to the Idaho legislature. So he was, uh, he was in a different atmosphere. Um, but Annie, who was an avid member of the Progressive Party, was right in the thick of politics too. She says she was often the only woman at, polit woman, woman at political discussions and that she read all of the bill books her husband brought home from the state house. She was actually asked by the Progressive Party to run for county school superintendent, but when she determined that it was basically just a secretarial job, she declined. I have no doubt, actually, that were Annie to be living in Jerome County today, she would be a lawmaker, one in the fashion of the inimitable Maxine Bell, who represented that area for decades, smart as a whip, blunt speaking, heart of gold. Annie's journals show that she continued to follow politics. As she wrote in We Sagebrush Folks, I shall never stop wanting to taste up the political soup, stirring around with my spoon to find out just what is at the bottom of the brew, determinedly attempting to give justice to all by my vote. And this is how amazing newspaper searches are. 
When I was doing research, I found this ad from 1938 when she ran for the state Senate in Utah as a staunch, quote, staunch Roosevelt Thomas Democrat. Here she is. She unfortunately didn't win, but we can see that she was a pathbreaker. She's the only woman in this ad for candidates. I should mention here that in 1919, when her husband was just headed to the legislature, he and the whole family were stricken with the flu. Greenwood described the frightful scene around town. Folks died like flies around a saucer of poison paper, she wrote. There were really not enough well folks to take care of the sick. Eventually, eventually, the Greenwood's lack of experience in farming and the government's lack of assistance led to the demise of the farm after less than 15 years. There was no love lost by Annie about that. She wrote, yes, we lost the farm, thank God. <laughs> she said it had become a case of us losing the farm or the farm gobbling us up. But for all intents and purposes, the farm really had gobbled them up. Their marriage, already strained, was over. My reading of her journal suggests that that caused a deep sorrow that she struggled with for the rest of her life. She knew it was the correct decision to split, but there was anger and there was guilt. Eventually, though, she did seem to make her peace with it. Charles and the two oldest sons stayed in the area for a bit longer. Annie tried unsuccessfully to teach in another school district and at what became uh, Idaho State University eventually. And then in 1928, <clears throat> oh, here she is, she writes after 15 years of it. So she was ready to, she was ready to go. Um, at, in 1928, she went to Salt Lake with her two other children, including Rhoda Kingsley's mom, who described it in an oral history as almost like they snuck out in the middle of the night. Uh, she, was, she was tired, you can see even in this photo. Um, they lived hand to mouth in a series of apartment buildings, including this one that was really interesting to use census uh, reports and um, letters from her editor to find all the different buildings that she lived in, some of which are still there in Salt Lake City. And this one is, um, was the Roberts Hotel. And uh, Rhoda, her daughter, had to drop out of high school in order to support the family. Here's a few sentences I found in one of Annie's journals that say so much. She writes, we are having a serious time, or I am, making ends meet, three living on $67.50 per month. I'm yearning for some advanced royalty. Annie tried her hand at selling advertising for radio plays. She even wrote some radio plays, but mostly I imagine she was working on her opus at the height of the depression. And I can only hope that she finally did get an advance. Unfortunately, I haven't found a letter from the publisher telling Annie that her book idea had been accepted. But as mentioned, there are letters from her editor during the writing process and afterwards. You can see that he had a great deal of patience with Annie. She had distinct ideas about what should be in the book and she was not short on ego. Going back to that chapter about sex I mentioned, here's an interesting interchange or ex exchange, he apparently wrote, did you admit entirely the sex starvation of the sagebrushers from the manuscript of we sagebrush folks? Maybe a little of that ought to go in to give a complete picture. And then another letter though that says, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your prompt response to my suggestion that sex relations should not be ignored, but I scarcely know what to say in your suggestion that you prepare a whole new part. If it, be, if it could be kept within the length of death, the problem might not be serious, but frankly, I'm quite appalled at the length of the revised manuscript. Um, and it was, uh, she put another chapter in. So somehow she convinced her editor to put a whole chapter in, not just a line like he had suggested. So she was, she generally, it seems like got her, her way. Um, really, really interesting. As a result of a visit I made to another grandchild. Now this is not in the boxes in Idaho State University. This is, um, from John Greenwood, who was the oldest surviving grandchild. This is an image of her book contract. And uh, it was not a good deal. 
she was only slated to receive 10% of the book price for every book sold. And that was only after a thousand copies had been sold. So I wonder if that even happened. It's, uh, it was not in her favor. Um, you see, despite good reviews, and here's one actually from the New York Times about We Sagebrush Books, a courageous venture back to the Western land. Um, the book did not sell well when it was published in 1934 and eventually went out of print. Um, you know, here's the, here's the original cover. Here's a first edition. Was it the depression that caused the low sales? Was it the themes in her book? Was it because it was too long as some reviewers and her own editor had noted? It was probably all of the above. Um, but gosh, how, how, um, depressing after all those years of work and hunger, after all the hopes she had, um, it was really difficult. In the archive, I found an essay in which she expressed her frustration that We Sagebrush folks hadn't sold better. Uh, she was upset with book clubs because they would pass around one book instead of buying it. Um, she kind of was annoyed with libraries because people could go in there and just check it out instead of buying it. Anyway, she starts ragging and, and then eventually she says this. She says, oh, skip it. It's all over but this article, which I write for the preservation of some other writer's future prosperity. As the first writer to likely have come across that sentence, it certainly made my eyes widen. And then in several other places, she expresses her belief that the book will finally be recognized. On this page of the manuscript up top, and turn it on the side to read it. She writes, when I am famous, this will be valuable with her own version of LOL next to it. Don't make me laugh. And in a letter that she wrote to her daughter Rhoda that was in the envelope with the pages of the manuscript, she writes, save them for Kingsley. They may be very valuable someday. In scholastic circles, my book will never die. I think it may experience a revival. I think it has, and I think it will continue to do so. And if I've had a small hand in that, I'm really pleased. I hope now that the material is in the archives at Idaho State University, that scholars will finally place her in the field of Western history and literature, as well as in women's studies. She deserves that. And now for the news, one way to keep Annie in the light, as I mentioned, is to buy her book. That hasn't been possible for some time because the last printing of the paperback was in 2003. And uh, there is another book, but it's really just kind of printed off the internet. But as of today, that has changed. You're looking at a brand new printing of We Sagebrush Folks by Caxton Press, which will be in local bookstores and available for online ordering. And this is I think I'm the first person to purchase a copy. I went out to Caldwell yesterday and met with the publisher and, and bought this. And I'm just delighted. Um, one of my goals in producing this documentary was to see that happen. And I've been in touch with the publisher of Caxton for a couple, four years or so about that. And the files had been misplaced. They came from the University of Idaho because Caxton Press now holds the, their, um, when it went under, uh, the titles went to Caxton. And he just couldn't find the, the computer files for it, but then he he recently found the files and he got it reprinted. So I'm really happy about that because after the documentary, uh, first editions went up to $1,100, $1,200 and paperbacks were running as high as $450 online. So it, they've come down since then, but still they're, you know, it's out of print. So it's great that there's been this new printing. Um, now, Annie would keep writing after We Sagebrush Folks, but her manuscripts weren't published. Um, and as far as I know, she never made any substantive money in her life. She lived with Rhoda for years and then with one of her sons in California. And this is John Green with the grandchild I mentioned, whom I interviewed. Um, he actually lived with her during that time when, when she lived with his dad, her son. And he remembers her distinctly in words that I think Annie would have really appreciated. He says, she had so many facets, it would make a diamond jealous. She rarely came into a room like you would irrigate a field, using a great metaphor. He says, instead, she would come in as the flood, 
and she would overwhelm the room. She wasn't out of control, he said, but she was on the edge at times because she knew what she knew to be right. And she was very often correct, he said, but not popular. Hard truth is not easy truth to defend, he told me, yet it is still truth and sometimes it needs to be said. And this is one of my favorite photos of Annie. She's feeding her cat from a cup. And um, as Kristen mentioned when she introduced me, I love cats. And some of my um, more emotional moments reading Annie's work was when I came across an essay that she wrote about her father's cat. So that's why I have used it here. Um, you know, while I've spent time in this presentation reading Annie's words and talking about what was in those boxes, a huge part of this project for me was getting to know and spend time with Kingsley, John, Don, Joan, who's here with us tonight. I also got to meet Professor Alexis Pike, um, whom uh, Kristen mentioned at the uh, top of this, that she's uh, a relative of Annie's who published a book of photographs inspired by Annie Pike Greenwood and the landscape of South Central Idaho. And she's in the photo on the left. So it's just some super people. Um, I continue to stay in touch with Kingsley, a composer and a musician. He says the experience of working on the documentary sparked a creative revival for him. In addition to writing a song called Roses for Annie that we used in the program, He's gone on to produce a whole CD of his work. I'm so happy for him. So these personal acquaintances were such a joy for me because they, they felt like a living link to Annie. Now, John Greenwood's um, father and uncle, Annie's sons, corresponded with Professor Ruckman when she was researching the introduction to the 1988 edition. And they told her that while they respected and admired their mother, they, they questioned the veracity of some of what she wrote. In the beginning of We Sagebrush Folks, Annie admits that she has changed some names and other facts, but that, quote, I have written only the truth. Everything in this book happened either to me, myself, or to someone else living in that country of the last frontier in the United States. Today, I think she might be called to account for some of the stories in the book and her memoir more intensely scrutinized. But for that reason, I'm kind of glad she isn't alive right now because I think we should read We Sagebrush Folks less as an exact recording of what happened in one small town in Idaho at the turn of the century, and more as a tone poem <clears throat> about the conditions in which so many people were living in that time and space, as we can see here. And I think Annie Pike Greenwood captured that better than anyone I've read before or since. As her grandson John says, I think Annie's stories, not just we sagebrush folks, but her poetry and essays speak in a timeless way because they are less about the history than they are about the human condition. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. It makes me emotional just to talk about Annie, uh, especially after all these years. It, it's, it's so exciting to be invited to do so. So I'm happy to talk now um, with you, Kristen, and answer any of your questions and answer any of um, the viewers' questions as well. Great. Um, thank you so much, Marcia. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I can't say anything more than that. It really was wonderful. And I do encourage people to watch the um, Idaho Experience video that um, Marsha produced. It, 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 it's a wonderful, wonderful um, program. Um, I just have a couple of questions, really. And I do want to encourage people to, to put other questions and comments in the chat. And uh, we'll monitor that in just a second. But I was, you know, it, we Sagebrush Folks is a big book, and um, I needed to read it in a short time. And when I first started reading, I honestly was a little annoyed by a couple of things. She's very wordy. Um, she doesn't over speak. 
um, but she puts a lot of details in. But the other thing was, it seemed like she went here and there and left and right and over here and it was five years ago and then it was yesterday and I really had a hard time tracking that because I guess I expected it to be more of a historical framework um like you know here we were in los angeles and then we went to idaho and we're driving up the road to where the land was and this was my first impression but that wasn't how she structured the book and actually i was in probably the third chapter before i took the time to look at the chapter headings and you touched on this in the beginning but but their wilderness education birth death, recreation, out of doors, sex, war, politics, faith, economics. And each one of those just was like, a, I don't know, like a, a little seed that things condensed around. Why do you think from just your, your research on her that she decided to take that approach more than a more almost accessible approach, a more historical linear approach? Well, it's a big question. And obviously, you know, it would be certainly something I'd love to ask her about. Um, before I answer, you can see what the struggle was as I tried to uh, place dates on her. I mean, I was going crazy myself, um, trying to figure out when she came, when she did this, when she left. And um, that's why I said I had to go back into census records to try and see when she was in Kansas, when she was here. So it was very difficult for me too when I read the book as somebody who was going to have to try and make some sort of linear sense out of it and at least tell people when she arrived and when she left. Um, I can only surmise a couple of things. Um, one is she was not writing, you know, every day. She had a life. And so she, and, and I'm going to guess actually that pens, paper, paper um, were at a premium, right? So, uh, she probably wasn't writing everything down consistently enough to make a good linear go of it, right? Because we all say things like, or at least I do, oh, I'm never going to forget what happened today, you know, and I don't write it down and then I forget it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just goes with everything else. So I'm thinking that it was easier for her to structure it thematically because, you know, she wrote this after she left, right? So she was having to go back and kind of recapitulate things in her mind. And I never did find any journals, I should say, from her time in Idaho, which was also kind of frustrating. So she, there were journals from mm. Kansas and then there were journals in Utah, <clears throat> you know, the bookends for her time in, in, in Idaho. So either she didn't keep them because she was so busy or she uh, or something happened to them. And so if, if she didn't keep them, then the best way to write the book was thematically. And I think it's very powerful. Yes, it's yeah. frustrating if you're trying to think, uh, you know, if you're trying to put together a documentary or a research paper or something like that to really nail down times and places. But I think, as I mentioned, it works as a tone poem. You know, it works, um, it really works thematically. And as a, the chapter headings, you know, I've thought about this too as to whether it goes back to say the primers that they, that they used, you know, in schools at the time, just very spare subject matter, right? That she was trying to get across. And to her work as a journalist, you know, trying to, it, it is ironic that the headings are so spare and then, then the chapters really need editing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, her editor died quite young. He was from Canada. And she was pretty sad about that. And I don't know if he was, if he had an illness when he was working with her or whatever, but it definitely needed more editing. The book needed editing. Um, for our purposes now, it's really interesting to read, but I imagine that it might've been difficult in the day. So I don't think we'll ever really know, um, but my best guess is that she, it was a way to deal with a faulty memory about or or the inability to write down everything that was happening because she was so busy with other things so it really grew on me i i really i really like it it grew on me too i have to say mm -hmm. once i once i understood kind of how she was approaching it was like oh i see um uh 
let's see, there was one other thing I wanted to ask about that. So one of the things that she mentioned, especially in the early part of the book, when she started the school and she was working with the kids, and you touched on it, was bringing that um, Victrola um, and the role of music. I mean, that just, she doesn't talk about it very much, but it, it bubbles up almost throughout her book where she puts on a, a record and people are out in the fields and they stand up and turn and look towards the house. She would even put it out on the porch. Um, do you have any thoughts or reflections about that? Just why that was so important? Like, was it from her early life? Or? Yeah, it was from her early life. So I found when I was doing research on her um, and I could probably pull it up on my computer, but I'd mess things up. Um, I, I found snippets uh, in newspapers from the 1800s <clears throat> of uh, recitals she had given where she sang. Actually, it's really interesting. She sang what in the day were, it was, it's horrible. They were called coon songs that, I mean, you know, just reading them is like, ooh, you know. Um, but she was apparently either in demand to sing in little house recitals or, you know, I'm not quite sure, but she also did write that um, song for Brigham, for, you know, what became Brigham Young University. So I think music was it absolutely a big part of her life. And there's some comments she makes. She wrote our articles for these education magazines. And she mentions with, you know, one of the things she saw right off the bat was that they didn't know anything about music. She was really aghast mm -hmm. and they couldn't sing. They didn't even really know what singing was. And so I, I think that music was very important to her personally. And one of the, um, she gets a piano. She, we know that she, she had a piano and there was a really cool thing. Remember I mentioned that half of the Greenwood schools in Rupert, mm -hmm. well, there's a piano in there and they, they don't know how it came to be. And I worked my tail off getting the serial number of that thing and trying to track it down and see if it might have been the piano actually that mm -hmm. she had. Um, and it, and as I recall, it could have been, right? So, it, you know, you could just never know, but it was from that era. So music was important enough to her to raise money to get that Victrola and to write an article about it and to have a piano. So um, I don't see any evidence after she came, went to Utah that she was involved in music, but she was involved in these radio plays, her, her daughter says. So certainly those would have had music in them as well. Mm -hmm. I just think she, she also believed that music and drama, as I mentioned, were ways to reach children who otherwise were uneducated or might've been bored by rote education or were in the field so often that they were not consistent in coming in. Mm -hmm. So she tried to use other methods to reach them. And I remember as you were speaking, I remember um, she had a line somewhere where it seemed like the music and dance to counterbalance the hard physical work that they yeah. did because it was it was joyful. And yep. uh, the life that mm -hmm. they lived was often, well, some of it I'm sure was joyful, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one last question, um, and then we'll get to questions from the folks participating here, but what's happening with the school at this point? Um, you said that there was a little bit of a initiative to rehab, mm -hmm. but what, do you know anything more about that? Yeah, and I think Joan can probably weigh in. I, um, I'm glad you asked because I originally had it in my talk, and I don't, I don't know why it's not in there, but I um, was really delighted that one of the things that came out of the documentary was um, a woman here, Sherry Freemuth, who's a wonderful architectural historian, preservationist, and she, she really wanted to see if that building could be put on the National Register of Historic Places. And so she got that ball rolling and then the state preservation office took that ball, hired a, a consultant, a fabulous consultant from Washington State, um, who I worked with, you know, giving research and and photographs too. And the end result is that in July, 2020, so a year and a half ago, the school was listed on the National Historic Register of Places. So I feel really, really great about that. Unfortunately, being on the National Historic Register is just a designation. It doesn't necessarily protect 
the school. And Joan Davies um, can give us a lot more insight into that because the not only did she go to Greenwood School, not only does she her family own the property above it where the Greenwoods live, but she also is very involved in historic preservation in the Haley area. So Joan, would do, do you want to unmute yourself and weigh in on that or um, yes would you please you know let us know because i i think i went in fact the last time i went to eastern idaho which was about there. a month or two <laughs> months ago something like that i could not even look over there like i couldn't i had to avert my eyes which is too painful to look that direction that's um, a nice segue marcia because yeah. i still go to the farm all the time and it's one of the most depressing places in the whole world uh, for me because i feel like i have grown through the annie pike greenwood and there are so many parallels between when the farm came back together my parents only bought the east half of that in 1929 and went to their graves wishing they could have bought the other half so when my son did buy it and it just happened at a fluke that they both came up at the same time and it came back together is like i can't believe that that happened um there is a real desire to have something to do to preserve it but i can't i can't personally get any momentum going with it there's everybody loves it everybody wants to talk about it but we can't get the ball rolling and the owner, Don Morrow, I just saw him three days ago. And he's not as he's a classmate. And that's painful also because he isn't feeling quite as well as he I would like to see him. So I've gotten to know his daughter very well. And she sees things from a different perspective. So there are uh, Don Morrow's grandchildren are living there. And there could be a little bit of momentum to try to get a scholarship going for those children in the name of those people that have been around Grand Greenwood so that people can put their arms around it but they're all at the moment pies in the sky so so these kinds yeah. of discussions are wonderful yeah it's really frustrating um there is another school and correct me if I'm wrong Joan maybe Oakley um that looks like it was built from the same kind of kit that greenwood was you know that maybe that's that probably they, the one that's in rogerson and rogerson yeah, yeah rogerson, they're restoring yeah. that and it's being it's it's a beautiful example and they are the same architectural local. yeah rogerson thank you and that community rallied and fixed up their version of of the school and i just wish that well because i know the jerome county historical society people are really enamored you know of, of the school as well and and even there are people who recognize their families in that book so but you know you know better than i joan that it's also a very very impoverished area too parts of it so um you know it's not like people are you know rolling around but it it it, it would be great to start a 501c3 called friends of the greenwood school and then be able to apply for some grants and such. Eventually, maybe somebody would just move it. it. It's not in a great location. That's part of the other problem. It's so close to the freeway. Um, so like if you wanted to turn it into a, a store or an, a uh, bed and breakfast or something like that, that would be pretty impossible. I mean, like a cafe, it would just be too loud. So I'm sorry, Joan, were you gonna say something? Oh, just there are some things in the community that are changing. There is a at Valley High School because the school closed in order for uh, through consolidation, and that's in 1954. And the new Valley High School, which is kindergarten through high school now, and there is a historic or a history teacher there who is um, married to one of the Shooties, and Carl Shooty is mm -hmm. has some interest. That's the biggest ray of hope that I've heard, seen in quite a while and trying to pursue something with that. So um, well, you you are you are a juggernaut. And so I, I think if you <laughs> led the charge, it would, it, it should, it, it would go, you know, 
and I'm going to have to go to Rupert and see the piano because if it's the piano that was on the stage in the basement of the part that went to Rupert, we probably, I've probably played it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we, I mean, Kingsley is super into music, as you noticed, and so I think he feels that's one of his legacies from Annie. Um, this was just a real flowering for him because he, he got back in touch with that creative side of him that he feels emanates in some respect from Annie, from that side of the family. And so he was, I mean, I have photos, again, I'd probably blow up my computer if I showed them to you right now, but I have photos of him like, like looking at very intently at that piano and trying to figure it out. So I think it's, I think there's a good chance that it actually was the piano that you played on, Joan. I might have a, it's I might old. have a picture somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very old and it's in there with that. It's an upright. With the motorcycle club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have ever thought the motorcyclists are having church think, services on Sunday? I think, yeah, I think Annie would really love that. I always felt like as soon as I heard about that, I'm like, oh, she would have loved that. It's such color, you know what I mean? It's such character. I think uh, yeah. Kinsley was interesting and in, in we were asking the questions, why are all these things happening? And his says, I'm thinking that Annie wants to be heard again. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. In the documentary, he says she wants to be found. And, and that's kind of how I felt as well with all the synchronicity that happened. Because, you know, again, going back to your son and the land um, being purchased and put back together again that happened right when we were doing this project you know and then Kingsley finally you know after 30 years of having this stuff um, right before I contacted him had decided to move forward with it so there was a lot of synchronicity involved there and uh, so yeah wonderful uh, and you, you ask why is it Greenwood it's still Greenwood my father came from Kansas from he was born in the county of Greenwood my mother's mm -hmm. name is Anne. There are so many parallels. Wow, we start that searching is those true. through. And mm -hmm. why we still own the property. Because if the interstate had taken all of the property off of the north side, we wouldn't have be having this discussion because it would have all disappeared under the under the right of way of the oh, interstate. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. And the, the house is no longer there. Um, as, as I recall, Joan, that was very decrepit. And you uh, unfortunately had to take it down. But it was there when we first started filming, so we did get some footage of it. It could be replicated fairly mm -hmm. easily. Yeah, I mean, my my dream or my hope, my thought was always that that school would make a great museum, not only for um, the area, but also to honor early educators like Annie mm -hmm. um, and and irrigated agriculture, you know, to, it's right off the freeway, you know, people there's stop. There's irrigation, there's, there's the potato processing, there is the wind farm, the biggest wind farm that's going to be in the United States that's less than three, well, maybe four miles from where it's sitting, um, all of that. There are so many avenues that could be explored and put together in there. Well, I had three goals. Beautiful, you're a, we're dreamers. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, Annie was too. Um, I had three goals when I made this documentary. One was to bring Annie back into the light, and hopefully that happened. Another was to see the book republished, which has just happened. Congratulations. And the third was um, to see that school re rehabilitated. And that turns out to be the stickiest wicket. So mm. hopefully it can happen in some way, shape, or form. Kristen, did you have any other oh, questions? You know, I actually had a question for Joan. I don't want to put you on the spot because we didn't talk about this before, but do you have a memory from the school? You said you were in one of the the last class or close to the one of the last graduating classes. I would just wonder if you'd share with us something or several things um, that well, come to in, mind. And your well, mom was were, a teacher. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> there's positives, there's negatives. What an education we got in there. My mother was a teacher there and was taught us in the fifth and sixth grade. So she was our teacher. One of those classmates has a doctorate degree from that little school and he's teaching in psychology. He's working for the, the government. And um, four of our classmates are no longer there three of the rest of us are still uh with us it was just a lot of fun we we wrote letters expressing our own opinion 
of what we thought of consolidation because we were perfectly happy in that little school. Mm -hmm. We did lots of things as far as art, as far as music, um, creative. Um, I could tell you about each one of those people that we're looking at right there, right mm -hmm. now. And this is ours. you, right? Is this you? Uh, I'm over here in the white dress, the little, the shortest one. Of the mm -hmm. Yeah, with, with the eyeglasses on, right? Yes, yes. And then is this, is the teacher your, your mom? Yes, that was. Oh, great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Rod Honor is there. He lives in, um, his uh, cousin was a legislator, Karen Hoag. The, the boy here on the end is Max Pelashenko, and he was a displaced person that came here to the United States with his grandfather from white, he was white Russian mm -hmm. uh, after the war. Don Morrow is right to the left of, in the back row there. And he okay. still lives there and owns a school. Hmm. Anyway, lots of good memories there. Oh. <laughs> I think it, I look back and I think it's, we were probably as well-rounded in those, because it went to the sixth grade when it closed, as most kids. We did pretty darn well as a whole, most of the students, academically. Hmm. Well, great. Thank you very much. Um, and I don't see any questions in the chat, and I, I imagine it's just because everybody's so fascinated with, with what Marcia and uh, Joan have been talking about. But if you have any final questions or comments, um, we'd love to have you share them. Um, just share them in the chat, and, and I'll read them out for you. So we'll wait just a few minutes. And There's if so either of you have comments, um, please go ahead. There's so few people, even if they just wanted to unmute, we could probably take the question just live instead of having to type into the chat. Sure, that would be fine. Yeah. Um, I always love answering questions. So Okay, I will questions. remove your spotlight, Joan. I mean, uh, okay. Marsha, and I will remove your spotlight, Joan. And so I'll go to gallery where we can see everybody. So yeah, so if there's anybody has any questions or comments, um, you can unmute yourself and um, feel free to, to ask it. Yeah, Laura, much. <laughs> Laura, you're leading the book discussion on Tuesday. Did, did any questions come up for you? Well, there, there are so many questions. I'm still processing. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I loved the book 30 years ago when I first read it um, and now reading it 30 years later, I get so much more out of it. Mm. Uh, and I look forward to the book discussion um, to see what other people, uh, they might be a little shy right now, Marsha. <laughs> well, there is a question it looks like for Joan. Yes. Joan, Joan uh, somebody, John wants to know, when you were at Greenwood School, were you aware of Annie Pike Greenwood? I think I've been aware of Annie Pike Greenwood from a very, very young age because um, my when the book was published, my aunt sent my mother a copy of it from San Francisco. And the community, you know, many of those stories, the shoes fit so well, the names were changed, but the shoes fit so well, people knew what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were having a book or a quilting bee and my mother loaned the book to the quilting bee and we never saw the book again. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yes, the Greenwoods, we have known the Greenwoods. I didn't know Annie Pike because she was gone, but we have known her son, my sister and uh, the oldest son were very good friends and met each other. And so they've been there a part of us. We've known about them. I just didn't know them uh, specifically. You know you know, one thing I learned from uh, reading the papers and also talking to John, um, the, child, the oldest boys were not happy with their mother for having written this book. Um, because I think she used some of the stories that she heard from them, you know, I mean, there's a, you know, a, you know, a girl who got pregnant or, you know, took her own life. Um, and they were embarrassed. I think they were pretty mortified that some of these things were in there where even if the names were changed, people would know who they were. And uh, I think it was difficult for them to have to have the book out, you know, um, because people did know who she was referring to. 
there and are a few people in the book that she used their real names. Yes, mm -hmm. and they're very proud of it. So the head right. of the Jerome, the Jerome yeah. County, she used to be the head, I don't know if she still is, of the Historical Society. She's very proud that her grandparents, I think, are mentioned in the book by name. Mm -hmm. So um, it also another interesting tidbit for you is that um, John's father, and I think he, I think that was Charles, um, he kept the book under lock and key when they were growing up in part because of some of the chapters we just talked, you know, we alluded to that were difficult. But also John thinks because it was his, he calls it a wound. He feels as if, you know, his dad, they really were quite poor and it was difficult growing up and his, one of the children nearly drowned and another one was hurt on a horse. And, and just, he said he thinks that his dad didn't want to look at the book because it just opened a wound. You know, it was um, when Annie moved away uh, I think his father might have still been in school and he was often alone in the house. And so, you know, reread it today with a certain feeling, but I think for, for many people, including her own family, it was a very painful. Um, it was, and, and then um, in there, in, it's expressed that those who were the pioneers are the ones that did the laborious work for those people who are to follow. So those of us who still have the farm, we are grateful for their efforts. Mm -hmm. mm, that's a beautiful way to cap off the evening, I think. Mm, was, I think so too. Such a beautiful so, statement, Joan. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks everybody for coming tonight and participating in this conversation. Um, Joan, thank you very much for sharing your your memories and just for just being who you are. Um, you're, you're, you're a great um, leader of our community. Uh, thank you very much. And Marsha, what can I say? Thank you for your work as I was reading off, you know, dialogue and, you know, Idaho reports and all that. I think we've all watched a lot of those programs and, um, you know, have grown up and I don't mean in age but in in knowledge and understanding of because of your work um, with Idaho Public TV and um, that's certainly the case for me personally um, with Annie Pike Greenwood and the documentary that you you oh, created. Thank you so much yeah. Kristen I really appreciate that. I will have another documentary uh, coming out December 5. It is actually on Caxton Press mm -hmm. <laughs> which you know I got interested in, in part because they published Annie and Pike Greenwood's book, but, you know, so many of our books about Idaho history have been published by Caxton. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that'll be of interest as well, continuing my interest in literature and um, just really thankful to have all of you out there um, listening and for libraries. So thank you so mm -hmm. much.